So now we're going to go through the osteopathic uh, perspective of the one-minute preceptor, hence they call it the one-minute osteopathic preceptor. Uh, today again, myself, uh, Dr. Uh, Tyler Simet and Dr. Evel Schwallenberg are with me, presenting some of the concepts we're doing uh, today. And again, there's a whole faculty development initiative for the profession, and we're kind of doing it along with the AODME and the ACOM meeting uh, for the training osteopathic primary care educators. What do we want to do? You know, we, it's very busy in clinical practice. It's getting harder to teach all the time. Uh, most preceptors say, I just have no time. Um, I'd like to teach, but I just don't have any time. You know, I have to see more patients. Uh, and we're brave with all these excuses. And, and they're not excuses, they're honestly the reality and people are going through and struggling with. Well, I think we have to find tools to help us survive and to let education thrive in the middle of this whole thing. As I mentioned before, the hospital profession is growing and it's tremendously. So now we have more learners, more people to train, we have busier clinicians, and we need to find ways around this. So we're going to look at this. We're going to find an assessment tools. We're going to look at things that help us look at osteopathic concepts, clinical precepting themselves. We're going to look at different characteristics that may promote this integration of osteopathic principles and practices. And the whole idea of this one minute kind of osteopathic preceptor is to give just one model tool that people can use. What is this? Well, as I mentioned, it's a tool. It's, it's a chance when you're one on one with a learner. It's a great opportunity for you to make a difference, to help them expand them. This model we're looking at is based on what we want all of our learners. We want adult learners. We want people that are engaged. We want people that, that are honestly doing things. We want to get them involved with their patients. We don't want them passive. We want them starting to make decisions. We want them to, to look at things. We want to get help attendings. In one area we're going to go through is feedback. People feel uncomfortable giving feedback. Can we help? give a higher quality feedback from attendings. Honestly, this helps attendings. It gives them some structure themselves so they can look at the encounter. How do I approach this? I mean, that's why ACLS is so successful. You don't have to think. It's in the middle of a tragic situation. You're going through these things. And you're like, oh gosh, what do I have to do? You know, and you've got all the steps going through it. You know, um, you know one piece of this is we're giving a model that's not inflexible. This model is looking at things, but you don't have to use every element, but you can use some elements from this thing. You don't have to go through everything religiously with it themselves. And you may also look at the whole mechanism, the learning themselves. So we're going to help this person be more independent. There, basically with this, there's five micro skills that are very helpful for a learner to go through. The first two are kind of focused more on helping to is diagnose. What's this learner? How's this learner looking at things? What do they know? How are they thinking? Because that allows you to go to the next step, which is the learner's needs and help them through that. You know, your chance to look at someone and have a topic and give a general application to it. Also, you want to make sure you clearly find out what they did really well and reinforce that. At the same token, if there are mistakes that have occurred, it's a golden opportunity for you to help correct those mistakes. So let's go back in with these five steps. We want to stop and make a commitment that goes with people themselves. We want to again, look at that learner's knowledge, where they're at, probe them for that supporting evidence. Where are they thinking of this? Can that general rules, things coming through it, learn what they did correctly, but also have all the mistakes they've been part of correct them. So that commitment, that's that first step in getting involved with people. That means we're trying to actively get them engaged in what we're doing. You want to see how ready, how much engaged that learner is into the encounter, how much they engaged into you know, themselves and what their competence level. You know, it's not asking for more information, you know, uh, just like what do you think, but also it looks at things, you know, diagnosis. Like, for example, sites, somatic dysfunction, treatment plan, you know, appropriate application of OMT, you know, a patient, you know, that's non-compliant, a consult, you know, it's themselves is getting them kind of committed into the area themselves. Well, how do you initiate this? So you're in the encounter, students sitting with you, you're in the middle of a busy clinic, you're on hospital rounds, things are getting busy, you know, and the attending 
ask this of all cases. Usually they'll come and they'll present the case to you. And they're going to, and they'll start off with how their case is going and where their plan is. And one thing sometimes that's hard, but it's helpful, is let the learner go a little bit. And don't interrupt them themselves. And part of it is it gives you a chance to look and say, what do they need to learn? Where are they at? You can't do this for every encounter. You think myself, if I'm going through morning rounds, I did this, I, I would finish at 10 o'clock tonight. So, you know, it's not. But this maybe you may pick a few key ones to, to work this with, or there's a challenging patient. That may be an ideal one to kind of work with that. So once you get that kind of commitment that they're involved with it, next you want to see is where they're thinking, where they're at. So you probe again for the supporting evidence. And it allows you to look at their readiness themselves, where they're learning, how, where they're at, what level, because sometimes you're differentiating what person is, are they more at fundamental level here? Are they developing some expertise in areas? Many of us had some really wonderful examples in our career of the word pimping. And I think we can all think of pimping in our way, I think our eyes roll back and the hair in the back of our, our, our neck goes because we've been the recipient of pimping. So pimping is not you know, what we're trying to do here. Probing evidence is not getting and drilling someone until they're you know, uh, at the point of decimation. So it is really giving that idea of looking for where they're at. General open question. Why do you think? That's, why do you think you're doing this? Why do you think that's the, the diagnosis you came to? And you want to make sure that you're catching their reasoning. Why they're thinking this way, they're thinking of going through that. And then you can look at that reasoning. One of the challenges of learners is they present facts, but can they connect it to a management plan? This allows that step to occur. So what kind of things do you say? Well, what major findings led you to that diagnosis? Again, open-ended, but it gives them a chance to let you know where they're at, and you can, again, diagnose that. What else did you consider? What kept you from another choice? In other words, look at that differential. What things are thinking? Where are they going at with this whole thing? This is a great opportunity, again, for an osteopathic intervention, because when you can look at this, you can say, well, what site somatic dysfunction are commonly seen with this diagnosis? And if they were thought of using osteopathic modality, well, why did you choose that modality? And, you know, or if, you know, something like that, if you're considering OMT, you know, what modality do you think would be appropriate? So again, these things help us to get evidence and ideas behind it. The third thing that looks at is teaching general rules. In many encounters, there are some really wonderful opportunities you may see that there's a general concept you want to get across. Or sometimes the, one of the things we're learning with learners is that there's the old trees and forest concept. A lot of students come through and residents and they give these wonderful trees. They go through all these details of things and you realize they haven't seen the big picture. Giving a step back to them and saying, okay, let's look at the big picture of this in general because they're going in one direction where if they step back and look at the whole thing, they'd be they're moving a little bit better with that. And you'll find also that there's many kind of things that learners kind of think about. Uh, I, I like mnemonics because I think mnemonics for me it helps you remember things like that. So uh, tenderness, asymmetry, ultra range of motion, tissue texture changes, we think of TART. So we talk about somatic dysfunction. And you know, it's always uh, fun for me when I'm reviewing uh, charts for some of the house staff and, and I'm looking at things and they put down no somatic dysfunction or someone admitted for cellulitis. And I say, hmm, someone has cellulitis. Well, I assume that that was probably tender I, I'm sure the tissues had some changes. Huh, what's that thing for somatic dysfunction? Let's go through what that is. It's, it's a great opportunity. And, and they're looking and say, oh, that disconnect. They were caught in some trees and say, this person's sick. They're thinking it's medical. It's not osteopathic. Sometimes they go into two different worlds. What a nice opportunity to step back and say, ah, the big picture. You know, they're all connected. They all work together. Uh, sometimes the, uh, also thinking of patients with gallbladder disorder, you think of, you know, fat, fertile, 40, flatulent, female, th those kind of things. And people take a look at those areas themselves and, um, you know, and other ones to do that, you know. Uh, you know, it's, again, this isn't going through, and there's other examples there too, but this is not a lot of minutia and going through things with that. But it's just, you know, again, looking at general principles, 
Uh, one example I did here was a classic one. Patients come with tension headaches. Tension headaches are very common. And, you know, when a patient presents tension headaches, evaluate the upper cervical region for somatic dysfunction and consider at least treating them with soft tissue inhibition techniques like suboccipital tension release to reduce muscular tightness and a headache. So, you know, that, that's kind of one general way. You could, you could use that example. Again, taking a common thing they may not have thought of, but a general idea with themselves. That's kind of, there's a superficial level. The osteopathic concepts go beyond just manipulation. You know, when people have tension headaches, you know, sometimes your novice learners don't think about, why are people getting headaches? You know, and a general application, did you ask them what's going on at home? What are their issues? That's really osteopathic. That's looking at the whole person. And that is something else to think about, that general thing. And they may have thought, did you ask them who's at home and what's going on? And then also you find out that their marriage is in discord, there's things going on, there's other stressors, and that's helpful. And since they're mentioned that, it's always good to build the confidence of a learner. And this next one is very helpful. And that is, what is done correctly? And really building up and saying, wow, you picked up on these things, these are things that are going on. This really helps because when they get that feedback and they see those good things, they're apt to kind of do that. If you see something good in a learner, you want to keep them doing that. Every opportunity to keep it a positive area to help build them, this is one of those things. Because training uh, is, you know, even though many of us uh, back in the day didn't have duty hours and things like that, they're still, uh, you know, they still, it's, it's a stressful area. We're, we're one of the few professions that's absolutely excited because we only get to work twice as many hours as everyone else does, you know, when we had 80 hours, and that's our limit. So, you know, so we, we're kind of an interesting lot. But, you know, one of these things with this is that we've got an opportunity here with them to, to get them out of this frustration mode sometimes and find positive things at the end of the day. So, you know, a patient also, you've been working with them in a while and saying, you know, think about somatic dysfunction with this. All they come to you independently and they say, wow, you know, I, this other person has come in and they've had, you know, a GERD symptoms. And I kind of noticed they had these problems in the thoracic region. You tell me about that. Wow, what a great opportunity to say to them, good job, go for it, you know, and in looking at that. So, you know, when they have these things that come out, it's reinforcing, especially behaviors you've been working at for a long time and, and going through it and you've been trying to make sure that they've been doing well. The other thing is you can have secondary gain. If you're in a setting where someone does something good and everyone else in the room has not been doing it, what a nice opportunity to build a thinking about, wow, you really picked up on that whole thing and great job. Everyone in the earshot knows they've done a good job with that, but also think to myself, oh yeah, I guess I better start looking for that somatic dysfunction thing there when I got patients with their clinical problems. So, you know, I, 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 everything we can get to get a positive thing going from there. I'm gonna spend a little more time on this next one because this is an area that I think it's a challenge. Um, many of us in education are not in your face people. So we don't like to get up to people and, you know, and, and kind, of, kind of berate them in doing it even though we've had that. Many people go to education, you know, uh, want to find the good things and present that, but we're human, we make mistakes. Learners make some mistakes. So, with this model, one of the key things is we have to correct those mistakes. The first line I want to go through, this is not yelling, okay. That's wrong, no, 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 we don't want to do that. That's not helpful, uh, and going through it. Uh, now, of course, it's urgency in the middle of a code, you may have to correct something really fast, but I'm saying in general, we want to have something that is, you know, we're not yelling. We're giving feedback. If you're looking at different models of counseling, they don't, ask people to go one-on-one -on -one at each other, they try to take the element of the issue and separate that away from here. So what we're looking at here is we're looking on the behavior. We're looking at the issue that's, that's, that's occurred with that. And we look at things we, you know, that can be corrected. We're not saying, you know, I don't like you. It's not that, it's not a personal attack. It is looking at the one area they can improve with. There is another way to look at these micro skills. And one of them is that you can also approach them, and I'll model this with this one here themselves, is using uh, something called getting a cue, looking at how the preceptor responds, certain rationale for this, and examples of how we do it. And I'll, I want to do this with this because, again, I look myself at correcting mistakes. This is one of the more challenging ones. The cue is 
how do you pick up on those things? Well, when you look at that work that they've come to you and you show a mistake that, again, impacts the patient, the way the team function, or just how they're effective, or maybe they're doing things right, but maybe it's not you know, the most effective way to do things. And some of these learners do additional things. You know, you pick up on that clue of where to go with it. So your job as a preceptor then, you want to do this as soon as possible. It's not very helpful if it is April and you say, you know what you did in October 5th? October 5th, I don't remember I had for lunch yesterday. You know, so you want to have these things that are very recent that kind of go on with things themselves. So as soon as possible, you want to find an appropriate place. This is not, you know, where that the old praise in public and have discussions in private. This is the discussions in private section. You want to find an area that they feel comfortable because you don't, for a number of reasons. One is you don't want to make, this, make the learner defensive. You want to make them open and you want to create an environment that's respectful. Part of our training and core competencies is professionalism, interpersonal skills, communication. We want to foster models of doing that appropriately, calm and private. You know, and that's you discuss, you know, what is kind of wrong and how to avoid or kind of correct those things. And one thing you can also do is, is allow the learner to critique themselves, to look at their insight. And that can help you with themselves. Hey, we went through that. Tell me how you think that went. Yes. Are there times you don't correct the mistakes? Sometimes it is a call. Um, if, if it's a minor thing, if you're in situations where you cannot be in a private area, it doesn't endanger a patient, there may be appropriate time afterwards with that. Sometimes you're caught in situations with, with that. And you know, I, I have patients, for example, treating and they may show a technique, and it's not wrong, but it's not as well as it could be. And I may look and say, well, you know, it's okay, but boy, they made some more effective in that area. Um, if it's an area that's endangering, that's, that's a whole, you know, we have a responsibility for patient safety. But, you know, short of patient safety, you know, if we could do something, you know, that'd be better for them, the only thing is we want to go back to that role of let's find a, as soon as we can, get in the right situation to give some feedback to that. And some of us, after time, we get good at doing it discreetly with themselves. So in the middle of trying to do a procedure, where you're kind of physically taking a hand and say, oh, that's nice, let's move over here. You know, some of us get really better and just make that smooth transition in the learner. And you realize people start to do procedures, you realize they really don't quite know where they're going with things themselves. And, and that's a nice opportunity to say, oh, gosh, we've got this thing. Hey, let me work with you on this one here. And it literally move things away from people. I mean, I think we get more seasoned. And there's a positive way that it's not embarrassing and, you know, we're not worrying about uh, patient safety and doing it, but it does help. So I, I think many of us are nodding and people nodding their heads. Yes, so we've, we've been there and that themselves. We've got to help save the patients and going through things. But I find a number of areas, and I think one thing, too, is a lot of people have to recognize there's more than one way to do things. I may have the Mike Rowane way, but I realize that there's also the other ways to do things, you know, and, and, you know, and they may get to the same end and you know, part of it to be a little more flexible myself that, you know, maybe that's okay. But again, I have the obligation to share with them other things that may help. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dr. Rowane. Yeah. Um, just a quick question regarding the um, giving feedback as well. Do, do you have a, a partic some particular guidance as far as giving feedback in the exam room or at the bedside? Yeah. Um, one thing is, is and once we have another session that hits on some more of the feedback here later with this, but I try to uh, create an environment where I'm with learners. And I even talk to the patient before and say, we're in a teaching environment. I said, it's one of the neat things I says is that as physicians, you always wonder what physicians are thinking. And I said, well, around here, you're gonna hear so much of what we're thinking, you're, gonna, you're not gonna hear all the things we're doing. So I kind of create this mindset when I do things myself, and I make a kind of a team, we're all kind of working together with that. I, I've, you've learned discrete ways to kind of do things, so a lot of times the feedback is I'll do some things like, well, that is one way you could do this, but another way to do this is here. So it's, it's an appropriate segue and, you know, to kind of moving in this direction. And, you know, that way can be effective, but you may find that this method here may be helpful. I, I've, I've gotten really good because I've seen people going in certain directions. Uh, I, I use a classic example is that a few of the folks in, in 
training in cervical manipulation. And, uh, and so as soon as they go to approach me in doing something, I said, wow, that's the way you could do it. But let me show you something. My hands are on their hands and showing them, wow, we could do it this way. And it, you know, specific things. That also gets that patient safety thing that goes with it, you know, help those things. Yeah. But it's, this is, if you look at all the ones, this is the one we always have nervous because it, we have to find a way to kind of work with folks at the same time, this is the patient safety challenge that we always have too. Well, you know, again, back in the rational, why are we spending a lot of time with that? You know, it's well, that's the truth is, is that if it's uncorrected, you know, they're going to keep repeating. If someone never shows them how to do things correctly or going through it, they're going to think it's okay, <laughs> and they're going to keep doing it, and not intentionally, but that's we've shown. And you know, be honest, some people have been shown by senior residents that really weren't shown it the best way in the beginning. And it's an we have an opportunity then to help kind of say, this may be a better way because they're the ones teaching the interns underneath them and everyone else. And so getting these learners correctly is myself. And if they're aware of the mistakes, and that again, they're knowing what they do in the future, and they'll reinforce the direction they myself. And you know, you may well be conscious of this, may reinforce that in the future. So you know, example I put on here, it's reassuring that your patients had fewer migraines since you've been treated with cranial manipulation, but you also want to address significant cervical somatic dysfunction that we picked up while evaluating today. We don't want to miss other structural sites that may add to your migraine headaches. So sometimes students get that, that tree, they'll come in and say, well, I think there's just one thing that causes headaches. You say, well, you know, headaches is a pretty big differential. Tell me other things you're thinking about, you know. And I said, well, you've talked about those areas. Did you do a neurologic screen with the, because sometimes, you know, I, I always really feel important for us to do a neurologic screen with patients that have had, you know, headaches. You know, it's, you know, that, that also mixes back to some general principles that also may help with correcting mistakes. So again, they can all, it's not rigid how we kind of work through that things themselves. So again, with this area of correcting mistakes, there are certain advantages to really addressing this and working with our feedback. How is the learner thinking? Um, you know, they, I think themselves, there's learners, they need to be, you know, uh, you know, we, you know we, we're looking at these whole things as, you know, what you have to do, you know, themselves, you know, before they get to an attending level, they have to make sure that we move them into, you know, a safe position to understand the right direction. Uh, you want to go at the appropriate level. Um, you know, what they need to know at each level themselves. And, you know, sometimes if they're going through themselves, you know, a mistake is, you know, they just made a mistake themselves and correcting it and saying, let's move on, let's try to, you know, how we can do this better from there. Um, looking at the whole feedback, um, we, one of the reasons I think some of us may have some difficulty with feedback is we've not had wonderful models of feedback in our careers. And so, we get a little uncomfortable with that, but also we're trying to get them to be comfortable with giving feedback of how they're doing themselves. And, you know, they want to improve. People do, um, you know, but they just don't know how and help them with that. And if you look at a lot of the different studies, this is what learners want. They want to get feedback. They want to hear where they're going with things. Uh, some of the disadvantages, um, sometimes when they're presenting a case, and you're looking at the whole thing, so there's a disconnect between what they're saying to you, what they're documenting, what's happening with the patient. And that also means that you have to get, you know, more information from them to really look at this themselves. And it's, you know, again, this is, takes a lot of development. It's not easy to do. It takes, you know, some time and some teaching to work with them because especially if someone's done something repeatedly for a while or they're in training in their mind, this is the way to do it, you have to kind of come back at them and, and reinforce the correct way. So we've gone through uh, these five micro skills. We've seen, a, I think, an opportunity to use osteopathic concepts to utilize them. We have these five steps, and each one has different elements. It's not something we have to do with every encounter, but there's some elements that may fit with each different encounter. It may be great to have a case at once a day where maybe you will go through each of these five, pick some to help advance that learner. You know, that commitment, you know, from the learner, that's that kind of that what is going on. Probe for that evidence. Yes, that's the why of, you know, why they're thinking, getting where they're at. Teach that general rules. You know, you want to get a general approach of how they think so they understand the concept. They have that big, you know, forest rather than the trees, how it all works together. Reinforce what they correctly. Basically, it's do this again. We want someone to do it again and again, whatever they need to do with that. 
and correct those mistakes, you know, don't do this. Those elements will help, you know, learners to be more successful physicians, and that's our ultimate goal, is find different tools to do it. With the model we've done with this is also, we have an opportunity with that to look at osteopathic concepts. To also make people aware on these steps, is there a way they can think with an osteopathic concepts involved with each of these areas learning to kind of permeate those and help kind of advance them as osteopathic physicians. Um, there's also a number of references we have also in, in different areas that have gone through this model. Uh, it's been a very successful model and uh, hopefully again, tools, that's the goal, giving more tools and hopefully this tool will help. Okay. Question? Yeah. At what point do you start to categorize the learner in terms of how they're learning and what type of intervention should be done? Do you try and get to that before you correct mistakes or before you start to reinforce what was done? In the beginning. So the, the question was, at what point in the encounter do you correct mistakes that have occurred? Or do you try and categorize your learner into what oh, their learning the style learner. is? Yeah. So we'll try to categorize the learner what style they're at. Um, it, it different phase themselves. Um, initially, when I'm going through the initial part, when I'm trying to, you know, getting that commitment itself and probing for evidence, the probing for evidence is the stage where I kind of get a clue where they're at. How did you come to that diagnosis? The reality is it's kind of seamless because when I came to that diagnosis, I get their thought. Well, you know, that hurt, and things that hurt are somatic dysfunction, right? Rather than, you know, I notice this patient has had this, you know, vasculitis. I know that that has working on some core models of somatic dysfunction, including respiratory, circulatory, and neurologic, and postural model. So we're at whole different levels where people are doing that. The other thing is when they start, other areas may help it, is when you notice they are making a mistake. And that really categories when you, and also may throw a shot because you may look at someone who's more of a senior resident, and maybe they saw a pediatric patient, and they didn't realize the kid was very sick. And, and you're picking that up, you say, well, they should have picked that up. Because a lot of times what hits us is that there may be a gap we didn't pick up. And some things an urgency when you look at a kid and you come to the kids to Kipnik and saying, oh gosh, um, what else have you noticed about Johnny? You know, well, I think he's feeling well. Well, I'm not feeling well, but I think you need a pulse on it. You know, so, you know, so, it, so it depends where we're at in the encounter. But I think what's nice about this is that in different areas it helps you see what the learner is. And sometimes maybe that initial differential may show one thing, that their connectedness at the end or maybe a mistake that occurred may really show it or not too. And it may help direct your intervention to them. And that may be back to your general principle. You realize that maybe they've gone down this path and you haven't seen the whole big picture.